So um, welcome to the 186th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Uh, tonight we are going to be hearing from Jim Muljanski, <laughs> all right, and Jonathan Katz, who will be talking about PostgreSQL, the open source SQL database server. The title of the talk, as you probably all know, is An Intro to PostgreSQL. Uh, I'd like to say how much we appreciate Bloomberg uh, allowing us to use this space. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone who's here for taking the time. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and your participation. In addition to uh, uh, Bloomberg, our space sponsor, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, uh, past and present, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Me Media for their support. Um, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who've contributed greatly over the years. Um, we do a, a few other things outside of just these meetings, and uh, everyone really uh, pulls together to help that out. Please welcome Jim Miljenski and uh, Jonathan Katz with an intro to PostgreSQL. Give it up. Who is here because they've never used Postgres before and they want to learn about it? Cool. Who here has used Postgres before experimented with it but need to find out more? Cool. Who here is here specifically to troll myself and Jim? <laughs> Perfect. All right, so we've made a note of all of that, so we're ready for you. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, actually, one more question. Who's used MySQL, Oracle, um, SQL Server, MongoDB? Um, Cassandra. Cassandra, Redis. I mean, the Redis, I think. Yeah. I, call, I consider it a cache store. <laughs> cool. All right. So now we know what we're up against. Cool. So first, who are we? Why, why can we speak about this subject? Um, well, Jim, yeah. you, you start off. You're the first person here. Sure. Um, Jim Moljenski. I'm the CTO of OpenSCG, uh, along with Jonathan Mason Sharp, who's sitting here in the front, and, and, several, uh, and another guy. We're organizers of the New York City Postgres Users Group, uh, the meetup here. Jonathan and I are both uh, directors of the U.S. Postgres Association, uh, which kind of its charter is to advocate Postgres use throughout the United States. And uh, right, so a lot of what Jonathan and I do overlap, so our introductions are fairly the same. Um, but we, we try, specifically here in New York, we try to just ed educate more and more people about Postgres. Yep. And uh, just to add to that, Jim is way smarter than me, so take everything he says much more seriously than I do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, really where we don't overlap is our experience. I've primarily been in the startup world, um, you know, starting you know, as a ver in very early stages. Um, I was an early developer at Paperless Post and got to basically scale that out on Postgres. And I'm doing the same thing at VenueBook, which is a, a seed-funded company. Um, and Jim has been working in the enterprise world, you know, with start, you know, even actually as a startup, as in startups as well, but He's dealt with much of the larger scale deployments that have you know, much different requirements you know, at the outset. So this is where we try to like, pool our knowledge and overlap and figure out the best way to talk about Postgres. The other way we do that is this event, PGConf US 2015, which is actually, this was the New York City Postgres conference, but we, sort of, we somehow had 260 people attend last year, so we decided, well, this is really a national Postgres conference, so let's just call it the National Postgres Conference and have it in New York. Um, note these dates and times, and for those of you who know Postgres or migrating to Postgres or want to give like a very contradictory talk, submit your talk proposals. They're open until December 17th because we, you know, as a community, we like learning more and more about, you know, what can we do to make Postgres better. So what is Postgres? How did it all start? Yeah, so it, it's, when we're doing a talk like this, it's kind of hard to do an introduction to Postgres when it, it's such a, a big thing. It's kind of like doing an introduction to Linux. What do you talk about? Do you talk about its file systems? Do you talk about the kernel? Um, do you talk about all the, uh, all the interesting things you could do with it? So we try to do our best and, and really starting from the beginning of history uh, of where Postgres came from. It's not a new database. A lot of people are just learning about Postgres, but truthfully, it's been around since 1986. And what else happened in 1986, Jonathan? Hi. <laughs> Jonathan was born in 1986. So, um, right. um, so really, it, it's gone through a, a few different incarnations, starting out with the, a university project. Um, then uh, a few gentlemen, including Bruce Momjin, who's sitting in the back of the room, I'll put him on the spot, Bruce uh, Wave. took it out of the university project uh, and started turning it into a more community project um, and trying to develop that into something more usable besides just for academia. 
Um, and then if you notice that change between Postgres 95, if you remember back the Windows 95 days, there's a Postgres, it turns to be PostgreSQL. That's when Postgres actually added SQL support. Postgres never didn't start with SQL, so all this no, no SQL stuff, Postgres had a different query language back in the day called Quell. Um, so, so it really was a, a no SQL database by, by the strict definition, but it wasn't until 1996 um, that you started adding PostgreSQL SQL in there. So just looking at the timeline here, the Postgres really does kind of, as you're using different relational databases, um, Postgres is kind of on the family tree of a lot of other databases that you may be using. Um, it's it's a, the next generation of Ingress back in the day, for, for those of you that used Ingress back then. Um, and, but also a number of other databases came off that same family tree line. Um, so if you see Sybase SQL Server, it kind of came off the whole Ingress family tree. Uh, but Postgres itself formed a lot of other databases. So if you're in the data warehousing space, things like Netiza or Greenplum or the new Redshift that, stuff that they're doing uh, off of uh, at Amazon, that's all po based on Postgres. So you're, the things, different queries that you're going to be running on Postgres, they're all going to be very, very similar, if not um, identical. Um, and a lot of the tooling that you're going to be using are the same because they're just forks of Postgres. So why Postgres? Well, it's affordable. I mean, if, you know, if you're looking at licensing costs, it's about a grand total of this. And the tech, you know, there's a lot of technology behind it, I mean, and which is what a lot of this talk is going to focus on, just everything that Postgres does. It's secure. In fact, um, he, I forget uh, which metric it was, but it was looking at the security of open source projects. I think Postgres ranks like just behind the Linux kernel in terms of stability and security, which you know, I, I like to think go hand in hand. Um, it's very flexible. Not only that, you know, I'll combine flexibility and extensibility that for one thing, you will find you know, whatever problem you want to solve, you can bend Postgres to your will to get it that way. And if it's not already in there, you can extend it. And you can extend it fairly easily without having to recompile everything. Um, you know, there's a lot of predictability behind the community. Um, you know, Jim is going to talk about the release cycle a little bit later on. But this is really strong community around Postgres and this very inclusive, helping community. One, one reason that I was very attracted to help out with Postgres is you know, aside from being a data nerd, I just found a lot of support there. At the first conference I spoke at, I quickly, and I was walking around, and I was probably like 21, 22, and realized, oh my god, I'm the dumbest person here. I don't know anything. But everyone was very supportive and said, look, we want to hear your perspective. We're going to correct you when you say things that are wrong, but you know, let's see, you know, we want to learn what a developer thinks you know, versus what a DBA might think versus what a system administrator might think. Um, I guess, last but not least, um, auditability and stability. Um, Postgres is very auditable you know, through its uh, write-ahead logs, which we'll talk about. But uh, there's actually, um, coming out in Postgres 9.5, there's uh, a special internal auditing extension that's being added that's actually been very highly demanded that um, allows you basically to uh, you know, audit every single command being run in the database. And also around auditability is auditability of the source code. It's very easy that's to it. see the different changes that happen throughout there. Um, so the, you don't have to worry about with commercial software being backdoors in there or different bugs. You see everything as it's happening. It's in a very open process, like other open source projects, but there's, it, it, it's different in that way. Everything is done on a mailing list. There's really nothing closed whatsoever. You could see every little change that's happening. So if you suspect there's a bug or you suspect somebody doing nefarious, you could see it happening real time. It, nothing gets checked in without it going through a process. So from an auditability standpoint, there's a lot of governments around the world using Postgres specifically for the auditability feature because there's nothing you know, n nasty getting put inside the code base. So, what is, so what's the technology behind Postgres? So what does it do? So the first thing we mentioned is a mature server-side programming functionality. What does that mean? Well, it supports the SQL language, the standard query language, which was developed to you know, interface, basically create a common language interface with you know, every single database out there. But there's more to it, too. You know, we're going to explore that. There is actually built-in programming languages that you can use within Postgres itself. And in fact, you can, you know, in theory, put all your application code on Postgres and just have, you know, have that do everything and then maybe interface it with your web server, which probably don't suggest having Postgres do everything. But in theory, you can. Um, Hot standby, high availability. Blech. So basically, 
you can run all these replicas of Postgres. You have one master, and you have all these replicas that you can query in real time. I mean, you can you can also have it in you have an asynchronous mode where basically the replica is updated you know as quickly as it gets the information, or synchronous mode. And there's several different levels of synchronous modes, but basically all the replicas will wait till they receive all the information from the master and then say, okay, we got it. You know, we're we're all up to date. Um, online backups. Jim, I'll let you take that one. Sure. So. One of the key things when you're running an enterprise database, um, and it, you can't have any downtime, you can't have some sort of snapshot where you take a snapshot at midnight and then you know, 11 p.m. the next night you lose all your data. Uh, online backups combined with point in time recovery allow you to take, take snapshots through your database without bringing your database down or affecting performance, uh, and then also roll forward to any point, given point in time or a transaction ID. So this way, as you're taking your backups and you're doing the appropriate things with your transaction logs, you're not going to lose any data based on your backups, whereas if you're taking just a snapshot of your data, you could lose all your data for the day or for, since your last backup. Um, table partitioning. This is something that as you get bigger and bigger databases, you need to partition your tables. Um, it's just the, the way relational databases work. Um, you, in the NoSQL world, you're going to be sharding your data, but you're going to be splitting it up so this way it's not all in one monstrous place. You need to be able to split things up a bit. Um, table partitioning is just part of the core of Postgres, whereas other commercial databases, they charge you an arm and a leg as an add-on feature in order to add that in. Um, Which ties into spatial functionality. Postgres has built-in geometric types right there for the taking, points, boxes, lines. But if that's not enough for you, there's this great extension called PostGIS, which is essentially like the de facto open source geospatial library. We'll talk about that a bit more later, but you know, again, instead of paying for an arm and a leg, you basically get all this for free or you know, create extension PostGIS. And last but not least, full text search. Postgres has a built-in full text search engine that's actually pretty fast. I mean, we're talking sub-millisecond queries over a lot of documents in there. Um, we, we frequently reference at the New York City Postgres user group meetups the Russians. There's this group of uh, Russian developers that have basically worked on all these like very novel database concepts that exist in Postgres, like having array data types, having you know, these full text searches, and uh, a bunch of the other non-relational things we're going to talk about as we explore more in Postgres. Security. Um, when it comes to security, Postgres, this is Postgres is, besides keeping track of your data, this is the number one thing that po people think about when they're adding new features to Postgres, is are there any security holds in it? Um, when you add a new feature, or even if you turn on a default, what are the security uh, consequences of doing that sort of thing? Um, this is why things like Postgres in the beginning didn't have any stored procedure languages turned on by default because that was a, a security vulnerability. So it's the thing that really is, makes Postgres one of the strongest things, especially in a lot of government agencies um, and, and other types of things where security is of the utmost concern. Um, it allows you to do different things inside the database of doing this normal grants to different objects within your database. Row-level security is something that's coming in the next version of Postgres. Um, but you could, you could also allow, allow you to plug in different types of authentication mechanisms for you. So this way, instead of just having internal accounts inside of Postgres, you could tie in with your, your LDAP, or if you're, you're stuck with Active Directory or something like that, you could actually do your authentication against that. Um, SSL support. So this way, all your communication with Postgres, with your clients, is all encrypted. Um, and then if you really wanted to get into it of tying things in to data level encryption, there's built-in functions that allow you to do that so you can encrypt your data at rest as well. Flexibility. Postgres, as we said, it's the standard, if I was the SQL standard. In fact, we have someone on the, the SQL uh, uh, standard committee, yep. So basically, as long as you write you know, compliant SQL, you know, it works fine. You can port it to other databases. You just have to hope that the other databases are following the SQL standard as well. You know, that's always the trick with standards. You know, of course, because you know, JavaScript, here's the world I deal with. You know, of course, JavaScript's gonna run the same in all browsers, right? <laughs> so Postgres also has this BSD-like license. It's essentially the Berkeley license, but it's still, it's the Postgres license. Just, there's like a couple word modifications. But what's nice about this is that people can basically take Postgres, fork it, may, you know, build their own commercial application on top of it if they so choose, and you know, they don't need to worry about the legal implications of it necessarily. But what's been very nice about this is that every, generally everyone who's forked Postgres has given back to the community. So even though they're running these commercial applications, 
they supported the community in one way or the other, whether it's code submissions or talk submissions or sponsoring features you know, in, you know, in different ways. Predictability. So one of the key things about a, an open source community is knowing that it's going to be there in the future as well. So if you're going to have your business rely on an open source product, you want to make sure that it's going to be there just as long, if not longer, than your business. Right? And you want to make sure that there's actually going to be predictable releases, predictable patches coming out. And Postgres has been doing that. Um, I went and did this, this chart, and going back to, to 2002, it's been every, every 13 months there's been a major release. With Postgres, one of the things that are different than other projects is a major release is actually the dot release. So a major release between 8.0 and 8.1 is, is considered a major release. And then the third number is the, the patch maintenance release. So that's something that throws some people. Um, even Amazon got it wrong when they first doing, started doing the RPMs uh, inside of EC2. They thought that uh, 9.1 is just a, a patch release on top of 9.0 um, and ended up messing up a lot of people's databases um, because sometimes the system catalogs start changing between those major releases. Um, w w things did get a little bit better, so this way you can now do uh, in-place upgrades uh, between your major releases so you don't have to do a dump and restore. That was one of the big, big uh, problems with using Postgres in the past when you're dealing with multi-terabyte databases. Now there's a, a PG upgrade utility that allows you to do that in you know, effectively minutes in order to update terabyte databases. So the community, this point we keep coming back to, that we have a very strong open source community. You know, part of it, you know, similar to the Linux community, it's just been around for a while. So it's developed a certain maturity in terms of tackling problems, recruiting new people, training, teaching, etc. What's also nice is that we have some very independent thinkers in it. You know, independent in the, you know, in terms of innovations, like I alluded to the Russian developers, but also, you know, trying to, you know, push the community in different directions. Simon Riggs, who is a major contributor, um, he just pushed out this thing called uh, bi-directional replication, which is code for multi-master, which, you know, on the surface, you know, a lot of people in the community were like, whoa, this is like really intense. How are we going to get this in? But he's gone through a process of proving it, running it in production, and it's basically making its way back into core Postgres. Um, there's also, if you ever look at the pgsql-hackers list, you'll see a lot of that independent thought going back and forth. There's some people who have very strong opinions about things, but I think we're all familiar with this in open source. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of people working on it as well, that there's these people who commit the software, who basically, you know, they have people helping review, and then ultimately they commit it to the, the Git repository, which used to be a CVS repository. I remember when that was migrated. That was, I, I heard it was a lot of fun. Um, but there's a ton of contributors, too. In fact, you can just look at... Um, well, not just the source code. There's a page on the Postgres website with all the contributors. One interesting name people like to point out is Julian Assange. Uh, he contributed back in, I think, 97, 98. Not recently. Not recently. <laughs> <laughs> but they actually... Well, I think they, they had to contact him about two years ago to get an updated email address for, for the listing. So, yeah. <laughs> Tried. He was the ambassador. Yeah. <laughs> So then the other really nice thing is that it's really a meritocracy in Postgres. You know, the more you put in, the more quality work you do, you know, and generally, you know, if you're a good person, you to get rewarded. And that is, you know, a listing, you know, as a major contributor, becoming a committer, becoming a core team member. And yeah, it, it's worked very well. And I think, you know, people have this very strong sense of giving back and helping and contributing. And, you know, of course, training, because if, if a community doesn't train its own people, you know, it's not going to be a community for very long. So who's using Postgres? So, well, so one, a lot of people. Yeah, one of the things about the community process and, and the way that everything's done within Postgres and it being a meritocracy, there's also no marketing department beside, behind Postgres. So there's nobody there trying to go get case studies and, and press releases and things like that. So who, we, when we find out about people who, who are using Postgres, it's just by them raising their hand and saying, I like Postgres. So this is just a small list of different uh, logos of people that actually raised their hand and said, I like Postgres. Um, but there are literally millions of other people out there using Postgres. Um, they're just not talking about it for a number of different reasons, whether they think that's a, uh, a type of advantage, um, a business advantage for them, or because they just don't know who to tell. They downloaded it Postgres.org. There's nobody, no marketing or salespeople calling them to find out, hey, do you mind being a reference for us? 
Um, that's one of the, the nice things about using Postgres, but also the downside is it's difficult in order to get, find out what other people are doing. Um, and that's why we're trying to do different things in the community in order to, to grow that. So, and there's, there's, a bunch, there's a lot of success stories out there. What I'm going to add, which isn't on here, is um, the American Registry for Internet Numbers, also known as ARIN, migrated from Oracle to Postgres last year and had, for one thing, had zero problems with it. Another, they actually ran into a hardware issue and all their, all their data you know, was fine. They were able to fail over seamlessly with Postgres and they've been having a wonderful experience. And in fact, uh, gave one of the talks last year at our conference. And you know, we like to joke that the internet runs on Postgres. I mean, effectively does. They run, they run their core system using Postgres. Um, but as you see, you know, we have you know, from big multinational companies to local New York startups that have scaled on Postgres to Skype, which I'm sure we've all used at some point. You know, people have built a lot on top of it. So let's go back to basics. So not knowing what type of uh, people will be in there, because we, we do get a lot of, when we're doing talks like this, we do get people that have never used a database before, that don't even know what a SQL statement is. Um, as people are starting out in their programming careers, all they're seeing right now is Mongo, right, or Cassandra, right? Um, they, they don't really get, have much exposure to a database, a relational database, and what that means. So bear with me for those of you that actually know what this is. I want to level set this for, for a few folks in here. Um, but the real key is that a relational database is just there to store data. Um, it's that simple. It's supposed to, you put data in, you get it back out in the exact same format that you put it in. Um, and it w in as quick as, uh, as human or computationally as possible. Um, but the real key is that key is it's coming back out in exactly the same way that I put it in. That's the so sort of thing that is really important when it comes to a relational database. So if you're doing like an inventory management system and you only have 100 widgets to sell, you can't like sell 200 of them because your system hasn't been completely updated yet. If somebody else bought them, you can't let somebody else bu buy them as well. So those types of things are important when it comes to relational databases. Um, and it really comes down to ACID, right? So, so being atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. Um, that is a key thing with the relational databases that when you're doing transactions, you need to be able to handle that. If you're just doing a forum post and it, you lose a, for, a, a comment, not the end of the world, you lose 100 widgets or you lose you, you know, a $10 million transaction, that's a big deal. Um, right? So Atomic being, it's an all or nothing. When you commit something, all the pieces of that transaction are together. You don't have it split up where part of it's committed on disk and the other part will be on disk a few seconds later. Consistent, so this way when you're looking at the database, when you're reading from it, it's in a, it's in a consistent format, so this way all the data is as what it's supposed to be as of a given point in time. Um, isolated, so this way you don't have multiple transactions being able to uh, be able to mess with one another essentially, so this way each transaction is gonna be its own little piece of work. And durable is when I commit, it's on disk the way I want it to be until I tell it not to be on disk anymore. Um, that durability is the key piece to a database because a database needs to hold your data. It can't just magically disappear later. Um, transactions 101. Um, it really is an all or nothing thing. You start it by doing a begin. Um, you do whatever works you want. Your inserts, updates, deletes, do whatever you want in the data, and then you commit it. And then all those pieces of work are all going to be together in a single format. Or you could roll it back where you say none of this actually really happened. Um, that's a key piece to relational databases. We'll get into a lot more cooler stuff in Postgres, but I just want to level set with everybody about what we mean by a transactional database. Um, because that, the whole part of doing transactions is key. You need to be, have everything all together. Yep. So one, just one quick word that you also hear around this is called multi-version concurrency control, or MVCC. And this, this deals with the visibility of the data on your disk. Like, you know, let's say I'm modifying one of my rows and it's in a transaction, I'm not gonna be able to see the changes if I'm, you know, let's say I have another query running elsewhere, I won't see those changes until that actually commits. And that's a really key piece of, key piece of Postgres. In fact, uh, one of our newer developers has been uh, dealing with that today as he introduced a race condition, and I'm letting him learn all about it. <laughs> and I figure, you know, let, we'll, let him, we'll let him dig a little bit more of a hole and then I'll get him out of it. So digging a little, <laughs> little bit until yeah. how, how, how Postgres handles the, these core function pieces of, of 
you know, an RD of mass. Um, it is fully acid. Right? Everything it does is fully acid. Um, but when you run Postgres, you run it, it's inside all the documentation, it's called a cluster. It's really an instance, right? So th there are a few different terminologies inside of Postgres. Um, one instance of Postgres maps to a single TCP IP, uh, IP port, um, which maps to a single database directory called a data directory, um, wherever you're going to put all this stuff. Um, and it's going to be a one-for-one -one mapping. Um, inside of that, you may have multiple databases, right? Um, other databases might call that schemas and things like that, but there are different databases inside that single instance uh, of Postgres. So we got a lot of, so what are the major features of Postgres? Well, some of these we've touched on, but you know, we'll dive, let's dive into a little bit more detail. So full network client server architecture. I think uh, Jim's gonna address that in a couple of slides, but you'll see how Postgres manages all its incoming connections, whether they're remote or local. Um, as the compliance. Okay, I think we touched on that, tran you know, transactioning. Partitioning. So as we mentioned before, you, know, you can partition your tables within Postgres using uh, the rules system that's been set up. It's not true partitioning as I believe Oracle does it, but it's basically a way to get the benefits of table partitioning until there's a better partitioning patch committed. Submissions welcome. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of developers like it because it uses inherited tables, so those yeah. object-oriented developers think it's kind of cool. And yeah. sometimes they go a little crazy and they end up with 100,000 tables. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's actually a really cool talk um, from, our, from our conference last year. It's a multi-level table partitioning, if I'm getting the talk right. Uh, I believe the slides are online. It's actually pretty cool. Um, so let's see, where are we on the list? So tiered storage via table spaces. So let's say you have an index. You know, it's very, it's used frequently. It's very heavy. It's slowing down you know, all your disk ops. Well, you can set up a completely separate disk for that index and have the table space map that index to that disk. That way, you can take the load off your primary disk and have the index happily running on another disk. You can also do that with tables. Um, I mean, you can also do that with databases as well. No, the, it's pretty nifty if you want to offload you know, some of your, your read and write ops. The, the big place where we use that a lot is on the really big databases when you're leveraging table partitioning. So this way, this year's data is all on your fast disks, and then your historical stuff from three or four years ago are on your slow disks. Uh, it allows you to move things around nicely and, and leverage your, your storage in a more efficient way without having to buy high-end SSDs for everything. You could still use your, your slower SAS drives if you really wanted to. Um, so uh, also going along those lines um, of just thinking about enterprise features, the online maintenance operations. This is things like adding columns to your tables and doing different things to your maintenance of your schema, of not having to do a t full table lock in order to be able to add that. So Postgres has added a lot of online maintenance operations of things like adding indexes and other things. So this way your t full table isn't locked while you're doing different things to your database schema itself. Um, we t touched on things like hot standby. Again, that allows you, it's built in replication for Postgres. And so this way you could, and you could be able to have read-only slaves. Um, and based on that, you could either do log-based, and, and Postgres has been doing trigger-based replication for years. Um, again, full text search, we, we talked about that. It's not, it's not Solar or Lucene, but if you have some basic, th basic types of functionality, why spin up one of those things when Postgres could definitely do it? So if you go to postgres.org and type anything in a search, it's using full text search for Postgres. Cool, so what are the limitations of Postgres? So database size, that's basically, that, basically a database that you create within your cluster, unlimited. You know, what can your hardware hold? Maximum table size, so one table within a database can be up to 32 terabytes. Why you're storing 32 terabytes of data in a table, I don't know, but... <laughs> That even gets even to the next one. The maximum row size is 1.6 terabytes. Again, so, you, you, so maybe you can only get 31 or I guess 30 of these rows in one table. I have no idea what you're storing, but okay, you can do it. Maximum field size, one field within the table can be a gigabyte. You, you already heard my warning before, but you, know, you might have like one gigantic like, text document that you, you decide to put into one field. And what's cool is that there is a, the mechanism for compressing this is called TOAST. I think it's the Oversized Attribute Storage Table. I think I got that right. <laughs> and um, yeah, like Postgres developers like to have fun with their mnemonics. And yeah, it, it's great. And that's why you can store like large text files and still retrieve them very efficiently in Postgres. Um, maximum rows per table, unlimited. Maximum columns per table. Um, there's that range. I, I don't know off the top of my head the exact okay. reason why. So 
So yeah, that, that's based on the data type of, of what the size on disk is for each individual and whether or not it's going to be inside the main page itself or it's going to push it out to its host table. Um, so the maximum rows per table, if you actually did the math, um, it's not technically unlimited, but it's well over a trillion rows in, inside of a table um, because if you have you know, a one byte or a two byte field in there it's, and with a row header, it's, you know, it, it, you know, it's effectively unlimited because you'd never actually want to use a trillion rows in a table. Um, it does get a little crazy. Um, same thing with the, the maximum data by, database size. It is unlimited, but there actually is a maximum number of tables in there of about two billion tables. And each one of them can be 32 terabytes, so there really is a, a maximum limit of the number of, uh, of a database size inside of Postgres. But it's 2 billion times 32 terabytes if anybody wants to do the math. Um, that's the maximum theoretical limit. You're, but your, your catalog at that point is so massive that it's just so slow to do anything. If you want to actually, there's a really cool talk about um, you know, the, the limits of how many tables you can create in Postgres. It's called the Billion Tables Project. Check it out, because it teaches you all about the Postgres catalog and basically all the metadata that's created when you're creating tables and columns and fields. So one of the reasons why we're spending a lot of time on these limitations is just because Postgres can handle a large amount of data. Regularly, my customers will have 10, 15 terabytes in a single database. Um, it could handle that sort of thing. So it's not even touching the, th the theoretical limits of it, but it could run those types of databases quite easily inside of a, a single instance of Postgres. Cool. Client architecture. So I play primarily in this area. Um, I tend to use this language. So I'm generally connecting to the standard Postgres libpq API, and which actually libpq is used more than just in Postgres. It's used you know, for a lot of different connection uh, handlers because it's a... Uh, which is very stable, and it's a very well-defined mm -hmm. API. Um, so you know, each language tends to have their own driver that's built. So the, the popular one in Python is Psycho PG2. Perl, I believe it's the DBD PG1. PHP, I have no idea. I haven't used PHP in a while. I think it's like PG something. Ruby, it's, there's a PG gem, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. We can go down the yeah, line. There, there, there is a connector for just about every language you could think of to Postgres. Um, most of them do the easy thing and just link to the C-based API libpq. There are a few of them like the JDBC driver that does a native implement implementation of the protocol. I think there's a, a pure Python one too. I just don't know the, the stability of that one. Um, the Psycho PG2. Right. Right. But, the, but the, the one that's kind of a native one that I, that's used all the time is the JDBC one. All the other major ones tend to use libpq. All right, so I told Jim before the talk that anything that has the word Oracle on it, that's his domain. <laughs> so one of the things that uh, people are surprised about when they start using Postgres is that it's a process-based architecture. Uh, from a Linux standpoint, and if you're a Linux admin, that actually makes Postgres really easy for you guys to administer. Um, because every time somebody connects to Postgres, it starts another Postgres process. So you, if you do a top or a PS, you could see all the Postgres processes that are there, and you could see the, the query that's running and who's the offending uh, culprit that's bringing, bringing down your server and be able to deal with that. Um, so it's not a multi-threaded architecture. It is a multi-process one. So that, that allows it to scale quite nicely based on the Linux kernel. Right. As it handles more and more processes, Postgres just scales along with it. Um, right. So there, there are a few different types of processes, the primary one being the Postmaster process. Um, and then, like I said, each one of them, each time you make a connection, it's going to start up another Postgres process. So if you, you have 100 connections in a database, you're going to have probably like 106 different processes. Um, when we look at the, the server architecture here. Um, we'll get into each one of these boxes. We'll dig down into it a little bit, but we're not going to go too deep because this is just an introduction to Postgres. Um, basically, every one of these slides that we're doing up here can be a full 40-minute talk um, if we wanted to be able to dig down into it. And Bruce probably has at least 20, 40-minute talks about each one of these pieces. Um, talking about the process space. Um, the Postmaster is the key one that everything gets forked off of. When you start up Postgres, it starts a Postmaster process. Postmaster process. Um, then there's a bunch of utility processes that are running in the background that do different maintenance type operations. Um, you know, things like the, the wall writer the write -ahead, for the write ahead log in order to flush things out to disk. Um, the archiver in order to move those transaction logs off to a different place. Um, checkpointer, because 
we won't even get into that because there's not enough time, but you know, checkpointing your data to disk. And then there's auto vacuum. Um, you know, for, for those of you that used Postgres in the past, they've heard of vacuum being the, the big downfall of Postgres. Um, it, it is, in recent years, a lot of those issues have gone away. They have been fixed in, in different ways. Um, and auto vacuum is one of the ways of doing that, of just having a background process that will go ahead and clean up a lot of the things that's going on in the database. It just, a lot of databases have to do that in order to compact the database and do different maintenance operations to it. All your, uh, all your processes as it's running will use di different pieces of memory as it's going. Um, the key piece being shared buffers. Um, one of the big knocks on Postgres is that it's slow. Right? And, and probably the biggest culprit for that is the default setting of shared buffers. Um, it's about, it depends on, your, on, on what you're installing it on, about, about 32 meg. Um, so when you first install Postgres and you don't do anything to it, you're going to compare it to MySQL or Oracle who might be optimized for a different memory. And Postgres is going to be happily trying to use 32 meg of memory. Um, that's a, a philosophical reason of doing that. So this way, so you could start up Postgres on everything from your old 486 machines up to the newest things that you get from, from Dell or IBM today. Um, right? so, so this way, you never have an issue starting up Postgres with that low memory setting. Um, you tweak that to a more reasonable setting, all of a sudden Postgres starts performing like all the other databases that are out there, even not tweaking anything else. Just on one setting, giving it a reasonable amount of memory in order to run, run with, with modern hardware. Um, in addition to the global segments, you also have per user segments for, for work memory um, and maintenance work memory. The work memory is Postgres' sort memory. So if you're going to run a query and it has an order by in it or something else where you have to do a join and it needs some sort of internal sort memory, it's going to leverage the work memory there. So just to, to touch one thing real quick on this is that you can actually change this within a query itself or prior to running a query. So let's say I know that I'm running a recursive, a recursive SQL query because, yes, Postgres can do that. And I know I'm going to be loading a lot of objects and then sorting them. Maybe I want to bump up my work memory just for that one query. I can do that on the fly, and then I can bump it back down for that connection. So Postgres allows a lot of this flexibility in terms of you know, doing configuration on the fly should you need it. So in, and finally, database has to read and write from disk. Um, there, there are four different areas where Postgres is really write, reading and writing from disk. The main data files themselves is your main database. If you look inside of there and you start digging in there, you're going to see a whole bunch of files, and, and you're going to be able to see they're all you know, named by different numbers. Um, but as a Linux admin, you're able to dig into it and actually see which tables are updated when because it's just file change stamps, uh, time stamps are on there. Um, there's not one big giant table that you have to, or giant file you have to worry about. Each one of them inside that data directory are going to be no bigger than one gig in size. Right? So you, it's going to be a little bit easier to manage from a Linux standpoint because there are going to be a lot of smaller tables in there instead of one big thing you have to back up and move around. Um, and as Postgres has to go bigger than one gig in size for each table, it's going to have that number one, two, three, dot one, dot two, dot three. And that's where the, the 32 terabyte the limit comes into play is eventually you hit uh, the integer limit there of 32,000. Right? But every time you're going to write to the database, you do an insert, update, delete to your database, the first thing it's going to do is write to the write ahead log, the transaction log. So that makes sure that it's durable on disk without having to do a random write into the right place inside the data files. It's just a sequential write to the end of the transaction logs. It gives us a big performance boost by doing that. And then your, your background writer will pick that up and right to the right place in a, uh, an asynchronous process for you. So this way, you could do a lot of writes very, very quickly without having to bog down and write, do the right place inside a disk. That's especially true when you're dealing with indexes and other things. Um, then the archive logs is moving those transaction logs out somewhere else. Um, and global files, that's something that Postgres has, um, because you have each database as its own little piece, there are certain areas that are global to all the databases, like your user permissions. So now for my favorite topic, being an app developer, data types, what we live and die by. So first off, we, Jim and I actually put together a three-hour talk that takes about four hours to complete just on the <laughs> data types in Postgres. It is long. It is extensive. It is deep. So we're just going to scratch the surface here and do as much as we can in about five minutes. So what are data types? Data types are the building blocks of your schema. Am I storing integers? Am I storing dates? Am I storing JSON objects? 
we, you know, we don't know unless we define them. And you know, that's you know, one of the fundamental steps when you create a table. What's, you know, what's also nice is that you know, in this case, your data type is optimized for the on-disk storage. So the Postgres developers have basically figured out, OK, this is the best way to store an integer. This is the best way to store a JSON document. This is the best way to store an array. And there's also a lot of functions around it, too, because sure, we can store the data types, but wouldn't it be great if we can manipulate them directly from our SQL statements? Because you know, the more we can do on the server, the less back and forth we have to communicate you know, requesting and transforming information. Last but not least, you know, as I alluded to earlier, you can create your own data types very easily. It's a function called create type, and you point it to basically a couple of reference functions which you can write in one of the procedural languages, and done. You have a brand new data type. There's, a, there's some simpler ways to do it, too. Um, some data types can be extended themselves natively. So, um, others, you can just create a, create a domain or create an enumerated type if you're doing something you know, like a list. So first, numeric types. This we actually spent about 30 minutes on, because for whatever reason, people get very passionate about numbers. Um, what are the basic things you need to know? Generally, if you're dealing with integers, you want to use integer. Small <laughs> int, this is like from like the olden days. Like it doesn't really do much. Big int does a lot, but it's going to be a little bit slower, because it's a big integer. So you generally want to play around with regular integers, and that covers most of your cases. Decimal and numeric. Well, We'll skip those for a second. So real and double, these are your IEEE 754 data types, basically the floating point standard, which means some information might be lost in the process. But if you have some sort of sensor you know, flooding you with data, you know, you and it's you know, IEEE 754 data, then you probably don't care too much about precision. You're just taking in the data, putting it in, done. But if you do care about precision, such as if you're dealing with money and things like that, we have the numeric type. So we're not going to get into the whole do I store money in integers versus you know, numerics debate. The one thing you don't do is you don't store money with these types. But these are actually very safe because they're designed with money in mind. What you can do with numeric and decimal types is basically you can fix the precision. Say, I only want to store you know, two, two decimal places right of my decimal point. And I, or maybe I only want to store 131,072 digits before the decimal point. <laughs> Which uh, actually, it's used for. Um, I think there's like NASA applications. Yeah, that use a lot them of right. astronomy applications. Yeah. right? it's uh, in order to be able to get that sort of precision. Some people actually need that sort of precision of having that many digits in there. So what's interesting is if you try to like cast something to a numeric on the Postgres command line, you can't actually do the full 131,000 whatever digits, but you can actually you can define your schema that way. So if you're pulling in data, uh, it will do that successfully. Yeah. Just um, if you, you think you're going to be the next Facebook, don't set your, your primary ID, your user ID as numeric. They end up being fairly slow. Um, at least pick a big in if you have big dreams. Um, you know, numeric, keep that for things that you're not normally going to index. It's going to be you know, things like money and, and types of yep. things like that. Yeah, speaking of money, there is a money type in Postgres. Please do not use it. I don't know why it's still there. Bruce, why is there still documentation? <laughs> the warning is not big enough in the documentation. It should be like, do not use this. This is bad. <laughs> it was a good idea, but. All right, so character types. So here's something interesting. So we have var car, which I'm sure everyone's seen. You have car or char, however you pronounce it. And then you have text. They all map to the same function in po Postgres called var len a. Basically, the difference is this you're restricting the length of your, your character. This you're restricting the length, but you're zero padding everything that's blank which can result in some really weird queries when you're using like and trying to do similarity queries. So generally, it's not advised to use this unless there's some really good reason. I'm sure there is. And then there's text, which basically says you can store as much as you want, really up to one gigabyte per, per field, as we saw before. Um, generally, the Postgres community recommends you're using text. I mean, of course, that might open up you to dosing yourself by people just like shoving like gigabytes of you know, text into it. So that's why you might want to limit some of your characters. But you know, it's up to you. Cool. So date time types, or data time types. But really, it's date time yeah. types. So in my, in my world, I deal with a lot of scheduling data. So I live and die by these, like quite literally. In fact, the date time support in Postgres is so good, I often use it to do my date time manipulations and calculations rather in Python, even though Python has pretty good support. But it's, 
I don't even know how to begin. First of all, this is a talk in itself, just everything you can do with uh, dates and times in Postgres. But the idea is that you basically, when you do a query, you get a readable date, you get a readable time. You can you know, do addition, subtraction, manipulations, truncations, uh, conversions. You can convert between time zones. Like all these things, you know, just straight from Postgres. Again, I wish we had more time because, like I said, this is a talk in itself, and I do live and die by this every single day. Just, but, just a big a war warning when you're doing your schemas. Either do all your dates and times with time zones or without. Don't mix and match them because then you get different things depending on uh, whether or not daylight savings time and all these other things that may change. Do yeah. one or the other. There's yeah. a, a religious argument about which one you should use, but just do one. Time zone. <laughs> so, and so with time zone, by the way, internally it maps everything to UTC. So I argue you should use time zone and... That I, cool. So, oh, by the way, so the interval, just real quick, when you read intervals on the command line, it'll say things like, oh, yeah, like one day, six hours, 30 seconds, or three months, two weeks, you know, four days. It's really awesome. Another thing I live and die by every day. Next. Specialized types. Well, this list is way too short for the specialized types in Postgres, but th let's do the basics. Boolean. It's either a Boolean, it's, well, sorry, it's either true or false or null. All right. Um, small serial, serial, big serial. So this is you're probably familiar if you use MySQL with auto increment. This is basically the grown up way to do auto increment because you're basically mapping it to a sequence. Yes, I went there, deal with it. <laughs> um, so basically, what the idea is that you know, by default, if you create a serial type on a, on a table in Postgres, it basically automatically creates a sequence, maps it to your, uh, your field, you know, let's call it ID for simplicity, and then it knows to increment it every time it's basically told to increment it in a transaction. So it doesn't know to auto increment it if you don't pass any specific information to it. You can change your increment. You can change your increment uh, uh, delta. You can change. You can reset your delta. You can change it on the fly within a transaction. Very many. You know, again, like everything Postgres. You know, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, by day, this is how you store your binary data, if you choose to do that. Um, I once tried storing a lot of image data to Postgres, and I learned a very hard lesson that that would slow down. It basically slowed down the entire table, but or doing lookups on the table, but this was like back in like 8.2. But, yeah. um, but sometimes you do want to store binary data in your database and have different images in there. If you think about a lot of the new uh, a applications inside of ba banking where you're going to take a picture of your check and submit that as a transaction. You want that image to actually be transactional with the rest of the stuff. And put, being able to keep that actually allows that image to be fully transactional with that deposit. Um, you don't want to have that deposit to happen without that check image. So this way you get an all or nothing thing within that transaction. So for all you networking nerds out there who know more about networking than me, which is probably most of you, you can store internet types in there. Actually, I, I made a hypothesis in a recent talk that with some of the other features we're going to show you in Postgres, you can basically create a DHCP server and have Postgres routing everything through it. <laughs> yeah, you'll see. Yeah. I'm not joking. Um, but yeah, you can basically, you know, and it basically validates um, the CIDR one, I believe, is the more strict one. It basically validates the exact format you're putting in, and you have to have your subnet mask set up correctly. And last but not least, UUIDs. You can use Postgres to generate UUIDs through the OSSP UUID library, um, and you can store valid UUIDs in there. I mean, you know, and of course, you know, if, if you know that you're going to have you know, more rows than you know, big, you know, big serial, or you, wanna, you have a distributed system, this is the way to go. Schema list types. Wow, OK. So now we're, uh, we're really getting out there. So first, we skipped one really important type, which somehow didn't make it to the slide, but arrays. You can store arrays in Postgres. Basically, you know, the array is like, OK, I'm going to iterate through this array, you know, position 0, position 1. And you can basically have an array of any single type. You can have an array of integers, an array of text, an array of XML documents. Whatever it is, you can put in an array. In fact, there's compression benefits to putting things in arrays. I know of people who've like basically taking terabytes out of their database because you know, they, had, they had a proper relational model with a bunch of like, integer data, and they compressed it down to arrays, and they got that compression benefit um, through, I believe it's actually Toast. And then uh, when we talk about indexing, you'll see how you can actually look inside those arrays. XML. This was added a few years ago to say, like, hey, we can store XML. We can build XML documents. We can sort of look through them. We can ensure they're valid. That's about as far as they got. Because um, 
what, another mm -hmm. project that was developed by the Russians um, was this key value store in Postgres called HStore, which does key value lookups. It stores everything as strings, and it does essentially sub-millisecond lookups on a lot of data. Um, again, of course, I, I probably should be giving the hardware benchmarks for that too, but you, you'll trust me on that one. So HStore, this idea of HStore led to this idea of here's what everyone else uses on the web, something called JSON, the JavaScript object notation. And there basically became this ground cell in the community to support JSON because there's no other data storage systems that do that. And it's the lingua franca now for you know, tran you know, transferring data on the web. The thing with the original JSON data type was that it was set up to store the data only as text, which, you know, it works, but it's hard to introspect it. You don't get that, you know, you don't necessarily get that native representation if you're just using Postgres. That's why they came out with JSONB, which is actually being, well, the 9.4 release candidate one is out, which has it, but uh, that release is coming out very soon. And with JSONB, basically it stores the, you know, the binary format of your JSON. What does this allow you to do? It allows you to compress the data. It allows you to look inside the objects and query them. Basically, you're getting all the advantages of a NoSQL database, but it's within Postgres, so you have you know, ACID. You have it being durable. And if you uh, look at some of the benchmarks out there, it's actually faster than some of those other databases Mongo. as well. Mongo. <laughs> so last but not least, um, I guess it's probably not last but not least on data types, range types, another thing I live and die by. So I often need to deal with, well, not often, I need to deal with daily dealing with room bookings. You know, NYLUG is having their meeting in uh, the Bloomberg office auditorium from 6 to 9. That's a block of time. And you, know, quite, you see this everywhere, you know, scheduling flights, you know, uh, dealing with uh, error bounds in uh, measurements. And this uh, one developer in the Postgres community, Jeff Davis, identified this and basically said, well, why don't I build this thing called a range type, where you can store at the lower and upper bound of a range, whether it's inclusive or exclusive, whether it's infinite on one side or the other or both, or if it's just an empty range. And well, let me build in some native types along with it too, with like dates and times and integers and numeric values. What does this allow you to do? Click. What this allows you to do is combine another feature which you developed, almost specifically for this, called an exclusion constraint. And exclusion constraints uh, using a, a special kind of index basically allow you to prevent things like double booking. There's no reason why an airline should double book you ever again because you can like exclude the range or the block of time that you're going to be in. So here's a little bit of a sad story. With dealing with you know, the space booking I have to deal with, I had this nice exclusion constraint set up. You know, no one could ever double book a space again you know, for, for a party. But we had to relax the constraint because there are times people want to double book a space. So the nice thing is you can add conditionals to your exclusion constraints, so there's certain things that don't apply to it. But yeah, you know, it's there. And you know, if you can actually get that ideal scenario where you can actually exclude like, things from being double booked or double overlap, this is really neat. Cool. So li like Jonathan mentioned, uh, indexes are used um, not only to speed up your different database queries, uh, those are kind of commonplace in, in databases today, um, but it also enforces constraints inside of Postgres, uh, uniqueness constraints, um, as well as exclusion constraints. Um, Postgres has, has a, uh, a wide range of different ways you could index things. Um, like I said, Bruce has lots of talks. One of them he just did was on indexing. Um, you could spend a, a whole day on, on indexing of being able to do partial indexes, functional indexes and, and you know a number of other different things but we'll just concentrate on the the core pieces of, of indexing the one that is the default that everybody uses is the b-tree index so we, it, it that thing that from comp sci the the data structures of having a, a b-tree of being able to find the right value inside that data structure inside of postgres it's very efficient and it's used for for all your your unique, uniqueness constraints there's also a couple other ones called the, the GIN and GIST indexes. Um, those are used for things like full text search, um, for your, your geospatial type queries. Um, right? So the GIN one is, is uh, I think, a little 
slower to update, but uh, so faster to read from. But, but I've done I've done actually personal benchmarks on that, and okay. actually I've I've had it like beat just on a uh, you know certain data sets. So there's actually been a lot of work, particularly in Postgres 9.3 and 9.4, and speeding up Jin and optimizing it. So a lot of things you might read about Jin from back in the day in terms of updating are just not true anymore. Right. But those things allow you to when you have a, a JSON data type, being able to index the entire document. So this way you don't have to pick which field you want to index. The entire thing is indexed using a, a, a JIN index. So this way you're, you could very quickly locate any sort of key or value inside of there. Um, yeah, and, and uh, doing a rate, uh, JIN only works for integer arrays in terms of the array types, but the lookups in it are lightning quick. Again, because it's, it's essentially like looking to a hash. So it's, a, it's order one time which means you're looking things up very quickly. So think about that from a full text search perspective as well. You basically know the, you know, the exact statement root you're looking up, so it just goes boom, boom, done. And the, the SP gist, that's for more when you have a lot of data that might be very similar. So this way, if you say you're, you want to index URLs, the beginning is all going to be HTTP or FTP, and then you have like a www. So this way, all those things are compressed into different pages inside the index. So this way, you're only going to be really tracking the deltas within that string as it's growing out there. So this way, it's more efficient on the space. Um, and then these are all different things that you know, in order to be really fast at different types of, of database operations, you need to be able to index things properly in order to look them up. That's why Postgres isn't stopping. Um, there are new index types coming, um, other than just the plain old B-tree. Um, the, the block rate index, so this way you have a really large table, so you're basically going to index the values at the block level itself, so you know what the min and max are on each individual block for, uh, for the values there. So this way, your index sizes are significantly smaller so on you know, those multi-terabyte size tables. Yeah, I mean, it's really, we're talking about like the, the table will be you know, terabytes and the index will be kilobytes. Like that's, that's the level of compression this index gives you. Right. And I still haven't figured out what the Vodka stuff is. I'm waiting for the big Postgres yeah. conference uh, later when we get the Russians to talk about it a little bit more. But yeah. I but think they wanted to call something Vodka instead of Gin because they're yeah. Russians. Yeah, and actually, like, seriously, the acronym is something. It's like Vodka Object Something yeah. Something Something. Right. It's like they're still working on new ones that make Postgres faster each each yeah. each release. Cool. So, so you know. Yes, SQL is good and all. You know, some people like it. I like it, but a lot of people don't because it makes you think very differently. It's like, oh, it, you know, I'm not thinking like an order of steps. I'm thinking of like taking sets of data and bashing them together, and then joining it with another set of data I bash together, and you know, I'm putting some conditional on it. But wait, I'm running a subselect, which is bashing something else together. You know, all this bashing, you know, make you know, can be very painful. So, you know, you know. Some foresight in the 90s, you know, some of the early Postgres developers thought, you know, why can't we put procedural languages in the database to make things a little bit easier, right? I mean, it's a little bit more intuitive for a lot of people. And I think it was more Oracle selling more databases by putting all your business logic inside the database. That was just their, their, their way of convincing people to run everything inside of a database. Um, but it, it does do a lot of good things for you. <laughs> yes. So, like, some of it is, you know, we were talking about earlier that you want to do a lot more processing on your database server because typically on your database server, your biggest pain point is I.O. You're basically going to disk a lot and pulling data into memory, and you're having more you know, disk memory usage, and your CPU is sitting idle. So why not take advantage of those cycles? Because after all, you're paying for that CPU. And if you're paying for that CPU and using the CPU, then you're going to have less communication between your app server and your database server, whatever you're doing, because you're handling a lot of the business logic on, on the database. Additionally, you're going to be creating more consistency with your apps. You might have multiple apps accessing the same database, and you want to make sure you give them the, a consistent function. For instance, if you're calculating the price of something, you, know, you have to add in all these fees you know, and other things, you don't want to write it in two separate places how to do that calculation. You want to keep it all in one place. And this is what the procedural lang having the procedural language support in Postgres allows you to do. Right, and, and for those of you that don't know, triggers are just events that fire on an insert, update, delete to a specific table that'll call a separate function. So this way you could run that business logic when an event happens inside your database. Um, this happen on any sort of insert, update, delete. Now Postgres has more um, event level triggers on things like creating tables and altering your tables. So this way you could be able to handle when those types of things happen. So which, which uh, procedural languages come outside the box? Well, actually, I'll, I'll go in the order in which they were added. PL Tickle was the first one added. Uh, Jan Weick, who wrote the procedural language loader, wanted to have Tickle in the database. And this was back, I think, in like 98. 
It was actually added you know, fairly early on in the open source development. But because he added Tickle, he actually d developed a generic procedural language loader, which led to PLPGSQL, which was Postgres's answer to PLSQL. And then I believe next was PLPerl, and after that PLPython. And actually PLPerl and PLPython got a big boost, and I believe it was Postgres 9.1, where they were op the, the loaders were really optimized for it, uh, so they would work more efficiently. And actually it created a much better API for understanding how to take uh, you know, other languages and put them in the procedural language loader. Speaking of other languages. So, so uh, you know, there, there are a lot of other languages that you could add to Postgres, and we'll get that in a second, but they're all done through extensions. Um, one of the key strengths of Postgres is, is extensibility. It's a great database. You can do your inserts, updates, deletes, but it allows you to be able to plug in other modules really easily um, in order to be able to add even more functionality to it. So earlier in Postgres, this was all done through contrib modules and running SQL scripts. Now it makes it very simple. You download the module. You do a create extension um, for your uh, Perl types. It's a lot like CPAN. Um, but it allows you to do things like adding new procedural languages, data types, um, adding other types of, of tools inside the database, and foreign data wrappers, which is a kind of a cool thing that we'll uh, talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, but you can primarily find them inside the contrib modules of Postgres. Right? The contrib doesn't mean that it's just some add-on thing. Um, a lot of bigger enterprises don't want to add contrib modules with Postgres. Contrib modules are really first-class citizens that it's maintained by the core community. It's not just something that was tossed in there. Um, and if you want to be able to get things elsewhere, there's a, a site called PGXN that allows you to have a lot, of, a lot of other external modules there for Postgres. So all of these types of languages can be added into Postgres. Um, PL Java, um, for those of you who actually want to write some Java inside your database code, you have the ability to do that. PLV8. Um, is becoming very, very popular these days with the, the JSON data type. So this way you could write your JavaScript inside your database, do different things of, of doing constraints on, on your data as it's coming in or being able to search it more quickly. Create, create cross-site scripting attacks within your database. And, uh, PLR is really cool in a lot of different financial applications where you're able to leverage R inside your database. You could even do things of PLR, pr R produce an actual graph from all your data and return that as a byte A and just show it up on your web page just through a, sing uh, a single SQL statement. Um, and we'll talk about things like PL proxy in a few minutes, but if you have different shell scripts, you could actually run it as functions inside of Postgres. Um, th there are different cases where you may want to do that based on a trigger of some sort. You want to be able to do something um, and be able to notify different things or, or do different maintenance types of operations. Um, or maybe you're waiting for a transaction to come in through and you want to kick off a backup. Right? You're able to do that with PLSH. And of course, you have PL lol code, which was written as an April Fool's joke, but it works. You can write like I, I is in your loop and it will loop over your data. <laughs> yeah, it, it's real. So data type extensions too. You know, extensions aren't just for languages. So HStore is technically an extension, the key value store, but it's an extension that comes built into Postgres. Some of, some of them you have to download. A very popular one is PostGIS, which we'll talk about in a second. There is a bioinformatic data types available. I think there's two projects. There's BioPostgres and PostBIS. Um, there's SSN, is that social security Social security number? number, and there's an email uh, one. Right, so yeah. I, I see this a lot in Philly, so I, I'm, you know, being in Jersey, I j jump between New York and Philly a lot. Down in Philly has a huge uh, um, healthcare type industry going, and there's a lot of people using the add-ons of bio Postgres to be able to have different uh, gene sequencing type data types inside of Postgres and be able to do detailed analysis on the, their, their genomes um, by using the, the extensions to Postgres that have you do different proteins and, and gene type stuff in there that is just a plug into Postgres. Yeah, so PostGIS, the world kind of runs on PostGIS because it powers so many geospatial applications. Um, PostGIS is a topic that could easily take a day of training, probably more than that. More it's like a week. Very, yeah, it's, I've looked into it a little bit for you know, doing indexing talks because it makes use of basically Postgres you know, underneath it all. But it basically adds all these complex geospatial types that have all these complex functions that allow you to do lightning quick overlaps or intersections or you know, whatever you do in the geospatial world. Um, it's really cool. Um, and it's not that hard to install. And yeah, try it out. Yeah, there, there are a lot of, 
Uh, state and local governments are using PostGIS. The FAA is using PostGIS. It is the best of breed when it comes to geospatial technology in, inside. It's even better than the commercial uh, counterparts that are out there, and it's free. Um, so, so it is a, a fantastic add-on module um, that is just kind of taking everything by storm when it comes to geospatial type applications. And what's interesting is, uh, at least this was a few years ago, Jim did a survey at a at a big geospatial conference and found out a lot of people using PostGIS didn't realize they had Postgres underneath it. So that's something we're helping to educate about. So there's also a bunch of admin tool extensions. Um, some of them are geared around basically protecting your wall logs and dealing with uh, archiving, such as OmniPitter. Sloney was the original replication solution that, you know, as an external tool. That's the trigger-based replication. PG stat statements is so useful. I, I use that. It basically helps you, it basically normalizes your queries occurring in the database and identifies which are the slowest ones. Um, PG audit, that is one of the auditing solutions out there. And I think that, you know, part of that and what they're working on the community is go roll into the full auditing solution. PG partman is an easy uh, partition manager extension. Right, so um, the, the moral of this is, is you get a, a lot of the things we, we hear about objections about using Postgres of saying, it can't do this, it can't do that, I can't, you know, I'm used to doing this inside of Oracle or SQL Server. Um, chances are somebody wrote an extension for it. You do a create extension and there's an easy way of doing it inside of Postgres. Um, just because it's not part of the core database doesn't mean that it's not a, a well-supported feature or on top of Postgres. It's just, because of different release cycles and other types of things, it's just an extension on top of Postgres, and it allows you to do all those things that a lot of the commercial databases need, you need to be able to do in an enterprise. Cool. So we know we're getting close to eight, and you know, people want to heckle or go, go to the bar or go home, so we're almost done. <laughs> like I said, we're trying to give you an overview and trying to give you as complete an overview as possible. So let's talk about foreign data wrappers. To me, this is like one of the most novel things about Postgres. It basically took the SQL med library, which is dealing with external data and how you can integrate it within your, your own database system. And the idea is that whatever, whatever your data source you're dealing with, you, know, you might be dealing with Oracle or MySQL or another Postgres database, but you can map it all to a Postgres table and it looks like you're dealing with a Postgres table. There's a bunch of these foreign data wrappers available that are both readable and writable. Um, and what I mean by writable is that you can basically do an insert statement and it writes that data out to that, uh, that, uh, right, uh, sorry, that so uh, yeah, data this, source. This is really one of the fastest growing areas around Postgres with extensions is plugging into other types of data stores and being able to read that through Postgres. Um, by putting in, say, the Oracle foreign data wrapper, you could do that link and basically do a database link out to Oracle and read from your Oracle database inside of Postgres and join that to Postgres table, table or join to uh, a Mongo uh, data store and being able to have Postgres run as a federated data store through this. Um, like Jonathan said, some of these are, most of these are, are read only. Some of them are writable. The, the Postgres one is writable, so this way that handles full transactions. So if you have multiple Postgres databases and you want to insert into a remote Postgres database and then you could have the ability to roll that back if the, the parent transaction has to roll back for some reason. Other things like the Hadoop one is also writable, so if you want to write your data out to Hadoop from Postgres. Um, and Redis and the MongoDB ones are also uh, writable, so this way you're able to, to push data into those. The rest of them are all read-only, which would be things like if you have a, a CSV file or something, you're able to basically have an external table um, inside of Postgres. But if you submit a patch, then they can become writable. It's actually not that hard to make them that writable. They're pretty straightforward. Some of them are. Some of them, yeah. Well, you, probably the, the flat files are, are harder than... Yeah. yeah, yes, they are. Yes, they are. So things you could do like with the Mongo FDW. So say you're, you're already using Mongo, um, you realize that it can't do everything you need, but you want to be able to move to Postgres. You could create a foreign data wrapper out to, to MongoDB um, and be able to pull all that data into Postgres. So maybe you want to do different reporting or something off your Mongo data. You're able to pull that in, maybe do a materialized view and pull that data into Postgres and run your, your regular SQL queries. Put your reporting, app, your reporting apps pointing at Postgres still ac accessing MongoDB data. Um, so this way you're able to use both of them based on what they're actually good at. Um, and Jonathan said, Let's show them something that uh, you wouldn't expect to be able to do inside a database. So this is showing a little bit of how the, the WWW foreign data wrapper does. So this is actually linking against 
the, the, Google, uh, the, the, the Google Maps API. So this way, in your where clause, you're putting in an address, and what it returns back is that uh, everything geocoded for you. So this way, if you wanted to be able to leverage things of, for, for your, your address table and you put a trigger on there, you could be able to geocode everything if you want to. And then what you could do is you could take this and then put, you know, turn this into a point type, put into a data, you know, put into your table, create a gist index which does nearest neighbor queries, and suddenly you can be searching against your basically your addresses, you know, in essentially, you know, you know, millisecond time. Right. With with the ability to do different things like this, Postgres is a database, but it is a full application server if you want to turn it into something like that. I don't necessarily recommend doing that. Um, but there are certain things that it could do very, ni very nicely, and when you're right next to the data, it might be better to do it inside the database when you have the abilities to, say, reach outside that database and do different things with it. So one of the knocks on Postgres is that it can't scale. Right? Um, you know, we, you know, the folks over at Skype said, uh, sure it can. Um, and what they did is they developed a a store procedure language called PL Proxy, which can leverage store procedure languages and foreign data wrappers. But essentially what it is is a built-in sharding architecture for Postgres. So this way, if you want to be able to scale your database horizontally, you're able to plug in PL Proxy and be able to run skate, Skype. Um, right? So Skype runs all on Postgres using PL Proxy. Um, if they could scale uh, to, to the levels, most applications could scale there as well, too. Again, this could be a whole talk in itself, but um, this is one of the ways that you could scale horizontally on Postgres. There, there are others. Um, being Postgres replication, this is a more common way of being able the built-in replication of Postgres allows you to have a, 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 a single master and have multiple read-only slaves. Um, so this way, if you want to have five, 10, 15 slave, slave databases that are read-only. Postgres has the ability to do that. And those, those replicas could be either synchronous or asynchronous. So if you want to be, them all to be completely up to date, you could have it synchronous if you were willing to take that performance hit. Um, there's also an add-on module called PG Pool. That's actually an intelligence proxy. So this way it could send all the writes to the master and be able to load balance the reads for you. So one of the great things about Postgres is how good is your hardware because it basically scales with your hardware. So you know, currently, uh, you know, in the latest round, round of load testing, um, I think this is done on this is 9.2. This is 9.2. Nine so 9.2 was had a lot of performance boost in it, and basically they made sure that Postgres could scale to 64 cores. Why 64? Because that was the best available hardware they were, they were to get. So if any of you are willing to donate some more hardware with more cores, so we can like you know further test this, you know, we'd be you know the community but would be very appreciative. When you're, you're talking about scaling and, and adding the complexity of sharding and replication, you know, in this test, which was you know every, all the data ended up being in memory, it could do 350,000 queries per second on a single instance. Um, so with 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 hardware having 512 gig of RAM, a terabyte of RAM these days, and you're able to throw 64 cores at it, why scale out and add that complexity when you're able to do that on a single box? Um, it, it adds a lot of complexity. You don't necessarily have to be able to scale that out um, just because you think you have to. Um, and if you ever see Instagrams talk about how they scaled Postgres, they really warn against sharding before you have to because you're able to leverage a lot of Postgres all on a single instance. So, for one thing, we just scratched the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to learn. And of course, you know, Postgres, you know, it's this very big piece of software. It's been worked on for almost 30 years, so there's a lot that's in it. So, you know, it's natural to need help. I mean, you know, I, I ask questions. I, I don't have all the answers. Post, like, you know, aside from, well, here's the primary ways to get in touch with the community. The first are the mailing lists. First, there are way too many mailing lists, but the ones you need to know are PGSQL General, which is where you go for general help or PGSQL hackers, where you go for feature discussions, you know, uh, proposing fixes or submitting patches. Um, there's a lot of local user groups, but you know, since we're in New York, we're going to plug the New York City user group, which we use the meetup.com infrastructure because it's kind of nice for that. Um, the other thing is IRC. Uh, Postgres, the PostgreSQL IRC channel on Freenode is extremely popular. I think it's up to almost 1,000 people regularly in it now. And there's this amazing person in it named Rhodium Toad who seems to be on at all hours of the day and seems to know the answer to everything. I think he's actually a bot. Yeah. Or, no, rumor was it was also Tom Lane, but they <laughs> proved that it was not. So Tom Lane is one of the major contributors to Postgres. And for those of you who've used... Why is the, 
Yeah, so yeah. They, they actually did a test to prove it was not Tom Lane. <laughs> but uh, for those of you who don't know Tom Lane, um, libjpg, libpng, and uh, Postgres. He's contributed a lot to open source, and uh, he's uh, still you know, giving a lot of time and hours to the project. But yeah, uh, it's very easy to get help, and the other way you can get help and meet the community is to come to this thing on March 25th through 27th, 2015. We are a fully non-for-profit conference. We run it through the United States Postgres Association. J Jim and I like to say we put in thankless hours of work, but we do it because we love Postgres, we love the community, and we mm. want to see it grow. And yeah, no, no marketing department. This is all open source community yeah. stuff. Yeah, and like, and really, you know, and one of the ways we like to see it grow is that we try to combine everything that's going on in the commercial world with what's going on in the open source world because, you know, both sides should talk to each other and help each other because, you know, both sides really benefit from the other. So we submit, we encourage people to submit talks about what they're doing with Postgres and their companies, how, you know, what they like about it, what they don't like about it, because as we say, there's always ways to learn. The other thing we're doing around the conference is we're holding a special summit around um, the regulated industries in Postgres. There, there's more information about it on the website, which of course we didn't list, but it's peachyconf.us. So with that, um, thank you for enduring uh, a lot. You know, I guess we might have gone a little you, you bit over, but hand. thank you. <laughs> you, can lower, you can lower your hand. It's not about raising hands. Uh, thank you. So we're going to take questions. It's about 8 o'clock. So what I'd like you to do is uh, I hope a lot of you have questions. Just line up uh, in the aisles, and uh, we'll just, yeah, I just take questions. just wanted to make sure I, we did have at least one question. That's why I said, let's hold it to All the right. end. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Bob Gazelter, we have SSL support. Mm -hmm. I presume that's SSL slash TLS. Uh, yeah, I so I think it depends on SSL the SSL v3 has been deprecated. So, so Bruce might correct me on this one. I believe we use the open SSL library, yeah. so it's up to yeah, whatever the, version. Of so, no, so it's, okay, so, whatever so you it's link on, to. So it's on you to make sure that you're using the that you version. use the correct version of open SSL without the latest generation of bugs. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 We just do it dynamically link to it. Suggest so fixing the slide set to reflect that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, also. Just one, one, one thing. No one told me the score is seven to three bills. <laughs> I've, I've been checking on my own. It, well, I'm a Jets fan, lifelong Jets fan. You know that should tell you everything. Uh, so this might be a basic question, and uh, you know I'm still learning this stuff. But uh, so, so understanding is that this is based on RDBMS and it supports uh, JSON files and you know, the no NoSQL stuff. So is it that it's storing those stuff in, uh, you know, in tables? Uh, how does it differ from MongoDB? In yes. terms of so so there, there's a, a JSON data type. So that's actually a column inside there. So if you wanted to mong mimic something like a Mongo, you would have two columns in there, one an ID field and the other one a JSON B field. So this way you'd get that same effective uh, thing to it. And then you would interact it as a select, insert, update, delete. There are some other projects out there, one of them being ToroDB, that kind of mimics the Mongo protocol on top of Postgres. It allows you to do that without having to do the inserts, updates, deletes, if you want. Hi, could you talk, Hi, could you talk a little bit about how uh, extensions may uh, update and modify the query optimizer? Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. That, so I believe the answer is that they cannot. Well, that's, um, well, that, that's, well it will in 9.5. Okay, so <laughs> I'm, I've been corrected. It will in 9.5. Yeah, right. So, so there has been a, a recent patch that just got put in uh, probably about two weeks ago that allows you to do custom scan APIs, uh, which allows you to inject in your own query plans inside the optimizer based on an extension. So this way, if you wanted to do things like leverage your GPU or be able to do things in, or do parallel queries and things like that, off the of top of that custom scan API, you could do that as an extension. So what, the way it is now, the only way to kind of tie in there is through the foreign data wrappers, and there you have the ability to inject plans inside the optimizer. So you can create a, a, a plan that is you know, less costly because it's a cost-based optimizer through a foreign, uh, foreign data wrapper. But you know, in 9.5, once that comes out, you could kind of create your own optimizer that's a pluggable thing if you really wanted to go that far. Um, usually, when it comes down to discussing Postgres versus the other um, uh, RDBMS, people want to know, well, what should I use when? And expertise aside and preference aside and things like that, is there a rule of thumb you can say when I should be using uh, Postgres and when I shouldn't be? Like, if you want to say specifically, like, oh, I don't think in a, low ra a really low RAM situation you want to be using Postgres, or I think I would definitely use it in this situation. 
Um, well, for, first of all, you want to decide whether or not you want an RDMS or a NoSQL database. Some, some NoSQL databases, they have, they fulfill a niche that you really need to have. You know, Cassandra having its, its, its replication across data centers and things like that, or, or Mongo has certain features on there that you really want for your application. When it comes to different um, RDMSs, um, part of it is cost. Do you have an unlimited Oracle license where it's actually cheaper to run Oracle than Postgres? That's true in a lot of play companies here in the city, that it's actually more expensive to use Postgres than Oracle because they, they have the infrastructure in place already. Um, so, so it really comes down to do you want a, a relational database or not? If you want a relational database, there's really no reason why you wouldn't just use Postgres outside of other business reasons. Um, it could handle everything from the low end embedded uh, case where Postgres is actually embedded in a lot of devices up to the large multi terabyte size databases. Um, where you might fall down is when you have large databases that fit more of a data warehouse right? um, and those types of things. Postgres doesn't have parallel query yet where you have to be able to scan across a lot of, diff a lot of different, uh, a really big data set where it might be better to leverage some of the um, data warehousing type, type things. Um, but if you just need a, a relational database, there's no reason why Postgres can't handle really all of your needs if it fits your business requirements. From a technical standpoint, it's going to fill everything that you're going to need. Um, from the low end all the way up to the high end. Um, I'm curious. Uh, you listed a bunch of uh, features under admin tools. Uh, I had a couple of questions. One is, um, how much insight does Postgres give your average admin or developer about uh, index fragmentation, statistics information, information like that, that you kind of need when things are going south? So, so the short answer is yes. <laughs> so. So particularly around statistics, you can look right in and see the stats. You know, you can see how sparse your table is, how loaded it is, what's being queried the most. Um, in terms of index fragmentation, this is where I'm going to defer to Jim because he's more of a catalog expert than I am. But you know, it's a frequent thing inside of Postgres when you're doing a lot of updates and deletes to a table that the the index has become fragmented. Um, there, there's a number of different queries that you could run, and there's tools out there that simplify those queries to find out how bloated your indexes are. Um, in order to be able to do that. That's really the, the big indicator of, of index fragmentation. Um, so th those are just part of the standard Postgres. So you could run those queries, tie it into uh, whatever monitoring tools you may have, and send off the alerts when it's you know, m more than 2x bloated. Um, so it makes it very simple to, to do that. What's the expense of checking fragmentation? Is it something that's happening constantly online, or do you actually have to take a break and go get coffee? <laughs> so you, you can do yeah. it concurrently. Yeah. There's, a, there's a feature called uh, create index concurrently where you won't lock out the entire table. Mm -hmm. But I mean, depending how big your index is, it could take a while. So you might want to go and grab a coffee. But it'll work. And uh, if, if the concurrent index build fails, it doesn't affect your current index, particularly if you run it within a transaction. Right. We'll, we'll talk about our drinks. OK. okay. Oh, yeah, and Postgres people like to go out for drinks. <laughs> <laughs> That's something you share with the Linux community. Perhaps we learned from you. Hi, could you uh, elaborate more on the H store and the JSON and the similarities and differences and why they're why are there two? Uh, that is a very good question and a very deep question. So H store came out first. H store has been around for almost ten years, I think. It basically was a key value store. It was added in either at version eight oh or eight one. Um, and the idea was, you know, there are things that are just simple flat key value stores that you know, key value data that we just want to throw somewhere and look up very quickly. So the reason why this becomes a good question is that there became this need for nested data because HStore was flat. And the Russians were like, OK, we're going to build nested HStore. And everyone else was like, well, let's build JSON. So it actually became a debate in the community where the Russians were like, well, first we'll build nested HStore and we'll prove that it works. And then we can layer JSON on top of that. And JSON will essentially act as an interface. So there's a debate about this for you know, probably a year or two. And the Russians did build out the proof of concept for the nested H store. But uh, basically, the, the overwhelming uh, idea of the community was everyone's using JSON. Let's just, use, let, let's just you know, call it JSON. We'll make it JSON. We won't layer it on top of anything. And we'll build that native binary format. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you know, for simple text queries, for simple lookups that are key value data, H store is there. It works great. It's, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. It's really fast. In fact, I think it's even optimized. It's been optimized as late as the 9.3 release, which is the latest release. Um, but there's definitely a lot more being pushed towards the, the JSON, and particularly the JSON B development, because it's just the lingua franca of the, of the web. Does that, does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so if I were to start something now, well, I have some stuff in H store now. Mm -hmm. Should I be thinking about migrating that to JSON so later? Then that's a good question. So when you, when you do the migration, it's gonna if you do the H store to JSON loose function, it will try to take things that look like uh, like numbers and map them to numbers within the JSON structure. Mm -hmm. um, Personally, I probably would put it in JSONB, but you know, if it's working fine for you, you know, why why waste the headache well, with migrating? It's just a matter of the different operators that you already have in your your code or whatever. Yeah, and I guess yeah. yeah. The other question is, what's the difference at the like at the application level? Yeah, so like, they're, they're, uh, the API is slightly different. Yeah. So there's until there's a reason to actually change. There's no don't change because you have to change your application code. HStore is going to be there. Right? It's it's the underpinnings of JSONB. Um, so, so it's, there's no reason to, to you have to change it. It's just it gives you another way in the future to access non-relational data inside of a database. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Could you give a very brief summary of why one would be, would prefer to use Postgres instead of MySQL? Well, I, I, <laughs> I said very brief. Well, I'm, sure. I'm also happy, how, how, that, um, guys, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be that could be a bit of a. a B baiting, baiting a little. Maybe that, that's more of a bar question. If you have, if you have uh, yeah. well, that, because there are just so many differences. I, I, I can tell you real quickly why a lot of people are choosing Postgres now over MySQL, and that's because Oracle owns MySQL. A lot of the reason why people originally started using MySQL is a hedge against Oracle. So this way they had some leverage. Well, <laughs> well, it, it it is to some degree true, um, but we'll talk about that uh, afterwards. Okay. Yeah. So 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 wait, wait okay okay hold on the question the question was for these guys if you have a question let, let's let's take it in order. Okay. You you had mentioned that uh, you introduced a, not, a lot of hot maintenance abilities in mm -hmm. recent versions of MySQL. Is one of them the ability to remap hot files onto different partitions and things like that? Is there ability to do that? Uh, n I don't no. Know. Um, you, you still have to lock the table when you're going to move it to a different table space, um, right? So, so you still have you have to be able to do that um, by locking it. Um, it's a cool, cool feature idea, though. Do you have any well-integrated ER uh, modeling tools that are built for Postgres? And have you ever been asked that before? <laughs> yeah, I actually got asked that by a customer last week. Um, yeah, it, it is a frequent thing when you're dealing with enterprises for ER. There are a few of them out there. Uh, PG Modeler. Yeah, that's, um, that's the new one that's open source. There, there are a few of them out there that are specifically designed for Postgres. A lot of the, the more common ones like Erwin work, um, but they're more designed for the commercial databases. Um, so, so there are some things out there, but like open source, it's you're, you're dealing with other open source projects, the ones that are dedicated yeah. for Postgres. Yeah, but uh, and there's some commercial ones out there too. I saw a cool one when I was at PG Day UK. I forget the name, I'm sorry, but um, there's a lightning talk for it. I'm sure it's mm. posted somewhere. But there's no, there's no free software uh, modeling tools right now. PG Modeler. Yeah. yeah. PG Modeler. Yeah. Um, I, just one more question. Uh, how do you find a... I, do people often come with questions about ButterFS and ZFS, which have a slightly different model than traditional file systems? And mm -hmm. how does Postgres work with that, or how do you tune for it? Oh, it works great on ZFS. Um, we actually we had a talk about it at our, at the conference last year. Yeah, at a, what they do at AppNexus with a Postgres and ZFS. Um, yeah, a lot of people that are using ZFS, I'll either do it with with Solaris or FreeBSD, um, but there are those that are using it with with Linux. Um, it works fantastic. It was, ZFS was designed for databases. Right? It allows you to, to be able to, to use Postgres on there. It's fantastic. It uh, you know, can say nothing but good things about it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Let's go over to Bloom's Tavern. It's over on 58th Street between 2nd and 3rd. It's on the uh, downtown side of the street. We're going to be, when you go inside, we'll be, yeah, get inside the bar and then go upstairs. Don't go up to the apartments there. <laughs>